we're back in HP land for this video. I mentioned once before that the HP 9845 is one of my all-time favorite machines, but when I said that, I was gesturing at this machine, and I made the sad acknowledgement that we'd yet to coax it into life. Under the circumstances, it was a little difficult to do a proper introduction. We had power, but scrambled logic, and we had attempted to bypass the firmware ROMs with modern substitutes, but it hadn't helped. There just seemed to be something more fundamentally wrong. But now, cast your eyes over here. This is another 9845, same model. Recently, we got the opportunity to acquire a second machine, and it was, uh, in air quotes, working order. And after some faffing about and accepting it's far from perfect jet, it's now in actual working order, except for the tape drives. Uh, it's working order except for the tape drives. Making a proper job of repairing that requires gear that we don't have. So they'll have to wait. The faffing about involved replacement of the mains power filter and all the Rifa style caps. But this isn't a repair video. What I really want to tell you about is why this thing is so cool. In 1980, there was a rapidly expanding market of desktop computers. Lots of new models on offer every year. But even then, this was a bit special. An exotic, a gold wing Mercedes in a world of VW Golfs. Let me get this out of the way. I accept that looks. They're subjective, but to me, this looks really cool. The two-tone case, the acres of buttonage, hidden drawers, lots of widgets. I'm eccentric enough to find all that very cool, but let's get a bit more objective. The original 9845A launched in 1977. That's the same year as the Apple II, Commodore PET, and Radio Shack TRS-80. Those machines defined what the home computer and personal computer were going to be. People have often referred to them as a foundation or even holy trinity of retro computing. But they were cost-engineered machines, and even the Apple II's elegant design optimizations were all designed to deliver a machine that was absolutely crude in comparison to this. Now, that's not just me throwing shade. That's a different set of design goals. Peel back the 9845's layers a bit, and you'll find that this isn't a single board 8-bit microcomputer. No, no, no. What this is is a slightly shrunken mini computer, but with all the usability features of a sophisticated personal computer. HP launched a recognizable desktop personal computer called the 9830 in 1972. They were followed by IBM and Wang. And over the next five years, HP expanded its range of single user desktops. And they hit a new peak with this thing. And by pinnacle, I mean these systems use a 16 bit mini computer multi chip processor. It has sophisticated graphics capability, it supports a ton of RAM by the standards of the day, and it can be interfaced with literally dozens of devices of all kinds simultaneously. Starting at the top, you have an integrated CRT with dedicated heat sinks and control electronics. This basic graphics model has a graphics adapter inside the monitor assembly. The character mode electronics are in the system base. This monochrome screen tube is a 12-inch green phosphor item. Color screens were 14 inches. In text mode, this one does a 24 by 80 character grid based on a 720 by 325 pixel layout. The graphics mode provides a 560 by 455 dot grid. For graphics, it uses 16K of dedicated memory. Now, it's hardly a modern NVIDIA GPU, but there is a dedicated graphics controller. This monitor is completely proprietary and not interchangeable except to another 9845, but it is detachable. There are catches on both legs. Hold them in and lift straight up, but use good lifting technique because it's kind of an awkward weight, about 11 kilos. For transporting, the monitor had its own case, as did the base unit. Yes, the 9845 is... Um, portable, or at least transportable. You wouldn't really want to go lugging it around much, and trust me on this, because uh, it really doesn't go in an overnight bag. The base, with a second tape drive and printer like this one, weighs in at 25 kilos on its own. Next up, you have this glorious keyboard. It really does have a key for everything. You have dedicated edit controls here, cursor movement here, function keys here, and a numeric keypad. And you have separate keys for store, enter, and continue. Just about the keyboard, this is full page with thermal printer. It can do graphics printing as well as text, and it prints 80 characters or 560 dots wide. Anything you can draw on the screen, you can dump to the printer. 
either side of the printer you have digital tape drives. Digital is important here. The compact cassette used on something like a PET or Sinclair Spectrum is actually storing an analog signal. The PET, for instance, could store 100K on one side of a 30 minute tape. It reads it back at about 1500 bits per second, but with an effective read rate of only 750 bits per second. The 9845 tapes are pure digital, like a backup or reel-to-reel -reel tape device. They're relatively fast and you don't have to flip sides. It uses these 3M DC100 tapes. The base computer came with a single drive. This model adds a second. Its tapes hold 217K at a time and they transfer to about 1400 bytes a second. But even more interesting, the tape drives are block addressable. Now that means that you can write them with a proper file system like you would on a disk drive. When this system was designed, the available floppy disks look like this. That's an 8 inch format. Getting an 8 inch drive inside this case would have been a real feat. The tapes, however, fit nicely into this tight packaging envelope. Most HP fans know the tape drives are kind of an eventual Achilles heel. In service, they were fine, and once restored, okay, they're fine. However, the capstan is usually rotted away in these old unrestored systems, and the original DC100 tapes have this internal belt, and that's not good either. They often sort of snap with age. It can all be put right, but our system hasn't had those repairs yet. We're still relying on disk drive peripherals because we have no access to the tools to do the capstans. Down the sides, you have ROM drawers. No single cartridge slot here. You have two drawers capable of eight ROMs each. They aren't interchangeable, though. Uh, there are dedicated slot groups for different ROM types. The ROMs are technically interesting in themselves because they use this thin film hybrid circuit carrying up to eight chips instead of discrete packaging. Just here by the ROMs, you have the big old power switch on the right hand side. Around back, there are four expansion slots. The slots accommodate a range of interfaces. Peripherals like the GPIO or Serial or GPIB Parallel, BCD, Disk Controllers, etc. Each module is made up of one or more boards in a ruggedized package. If it's an interface adapter, the cable is usually capped. On this system, we have a real-time clock, and this one over here with the cable is an HPIB bus controller. Of course, this was a professional machine rather than a consumer system. Members of the team behind the 9845 described it this way. The key concept was to provide in one attractive and convenient package all the normal performance features that would be required to solve a typical problem. To achieve the same functional capability with a previous generation computer would have required three separate instruments in addition to the computer. The problem that they were trying to solve was an engineering or scientific one. Well, that's HP's heritage. Home computers were sold for professional use too, of course, so technically they were genuinely competing in the same market Although that's rather stretching the point. I mean, just look at the money situation. The 9845 was expensive enough to choke a horse, at least if you compare it to a home computer. In $1980, this configuration cost about $23,500. We'll put that in perspective. At the time, my parents were rocking a 1974 Chevrolet Malibu Classic. Now, if they had found some funds down the back of the sofa, they could have bought a brand new 1980 model for about $6,000. So the 9845 cost about four times as much as a family car at the time. An Apple II, with all the trimmings, would have come in at about two grand with, you know, drives, printer, and monitor. I'm sorry to say that my folks didn't bring home a new Malibu, Apple, or HP. Uh, they did buy a new Chevy pickup truck, which still holds the record for the lowest quality vehicle ever in my own experience. That's another story. So yes, this is a totally ridiculous comparison in one way, but in terms of what a personal or desktop computer could be, it's still useful to provide that context. Ansgar Kukis publishes the authoritative web resource on the HP 9845. Now he made the same comparison long before we did. And he says that we should really call the 9845 the first workstation rather than a PC. Well, he's not wrong. If you want to learn more from the definitive source, then he's your man. You can just find the links below uh, to that site and other resources uh, in our video description. But what are we calling a workstation? A PC on steroids is probably the shortest definition, but typically we're talking about a dedicated machine dedicated to an individual that is capable of highly technical computing that a commodity machine at the same time couldn't achieve. The market segment was built on the one meg machine, that is, systems that had greater than one megahertz processors and one megabyte of RAM. Pretty early, the definition begins to include GUI capabilities. Names that usually crop up here are Sun, Apollo, SGI, and DEC. 
One other candidate for the title of first workstation is the ICL Three Rivers Perk. Now, this was released in 1980, the same year that our machine was built. Now, let's compare the two. This machine has 256K of RAM up to about a megabyte. It has an internal hard drive and was capable of having really elaborate operating systems up to and including a Unix port. It has a passing resemblance to the Xerox Alto. The Alto is, of course, another candidate for first workstation, but it was never a publicly marketed offering. The Perk has a higher resolution GUI targeted monitor compared to the HP. The monitor was still monochrome, but two times the resolution in one direction and one and a half in the other. Like the Alto, it runs in portrait mode. The Perk's graphics processor also had native support for animation primitives, allowing good windowing performance. But the Perk is hardly a desktop. It's a massive tower machine, as you can see. And this thing started at about $27,000. And uh, let's see, if you took the base system and then you added 2200 for a floppy and then 340 for the OS and then another 1600 for the hard drive and uh, oh, uh, 3900 for the printer. So, you know, ready to use this thing cost a third more than the HP 9845. However, the technical computing objective of the machine's design is much the same. It's just that HP specialized in making ruggedized, highly developed, and highly packaged systems. Earlier HP desktops had always been designed to work in facilities like factories and, and engineering shops and uh, engineering laboratories, whereas this thing, this thing is at home in a computer lab. The first perks like this one are made of a, a sturdy steel chassis, but then all the trim is just this sort of vacuum form plastic, and it's it's uh, it's not very sturdy. Um, you know, compare that to the HP. The HP is a sleek thing, all soft curves and rigid construction. The components of a mini computer are shoehorned into a cage just tall enough to accommodate the relatively short cards. Printer, CRT, and mass storage are all directly accommodated in the physical envelope with mini computer level electronics. To achieve a high degree of integration, HP custom designed much of the componentry in house, including the peripheral devices, but also the controller chips and the processors. For instance, the printer and tape drives are specific to this machine alone. Our next video is going to explore exactly what that looks like inside. We're going to have a look at the HP 9845's internal architecture and construction. Thanks for joining us. Keep an eye out for that next video, and if you like this sort of thing, please like and subscribe. See you around.